Mechanisms and Characteristics of Musculoskeletal and Nerve Trauma Trauma is defined as a physical injury or wound that is produced by internal or external forces. A mechanical injury results from force or mechanical energy that changes the state of rest or uniform motion of matter. A load is an external force acting on the body, causing internal reactions within the tissues. Stiffness is the ability of tissues to resist a load. The greater the stiffness, the greater the magnitude the load can resist. Stress is the internal resistance to load, and strain is the internal change in tissue, that is the link that results in a deformation. Tissue Properties Body tissues are viscoelastic and contain both viscous and elastic properties. There is a thing called the yield point. This is the point at which elasticity is almost exceeded as the yielding point. If deformation persists following the release of the load, permanent or plastic changes result. When yield points as far exceeded, mechanical failure occurs, resulting in damage to the tissue. A tension is a force that pulls and stresses tissues. Shearing is a force that moves across the parallel organization of a tissue. Torsion, a load occurs by a twisting in the opposite direction from opposite ends. This is important for tissue properties such as bone health. This is how we end up with some fractures and different types of injuries that we'll discuss. Traumatic versus overuse injuries. The nature of physical activity dictates that over time, injury will occur. When an injury is acute, something has initiated the injury process. Typically, we understand and we know exactly what happened, when it happened, and how it happened. The injury becomes chronic when it does not properly heal. Typically, chronic injuries are a result of chronic microtraumatic injuries. Usually, they're not a major issue and they happen slowly over time. Traumatic versus overuse injuries. These can be defined based upon the mechanism of the injury. Traumatic injuries are often the result of a direct blow. Overuse injuries, on the other hand, are the result of repetitive dynamic use forces over time. This results in chronic microtraumatic injuries. Musculotendinous unit injuries. There are anatomical characteristics of muscle. Muscle is composed of contractile cells that produce movement. Musculotendinous units possess the following characteristics. They are irritable, conductive, and they are also elastic. Skeletal muscle has three types of muscle, cardiac, smooth, and striated. Muscle strains occur as a result of a stretch, tear, or a rip to the muscle or adjacent tissue. The cause is often obscure, so we don't always know exactly what happened. These types of injuries can range from minute separation of connective tissue to complete tendinous avulsion or muscle rupture. There are three grades of muscle strains. Grade 1, some fibers have been stretched or actually torn, resulting in tenderness and pain on active range of motion. Movement is painful, but full range of motion is present. A grade 2 strain. A number of fibers have been torn and active contraction is painful. Usually there is a depression or a divot that is palpable and may even be noticeable. There should be some swelling and discoloration as a result of this type of injury. A grade 3 strain includes a complete rupture of the muscle or musculotendinous junction. There is significant impairment initially with a great deal of pain that diminishes due to nerve damage. Pathologically, a strain is very similar to a contusion or a sprain with capillary or blood vessel hemorrhage. The time required for healing can be lengthy. Unfortunately, this type of injury often involves large and force-producing muscles. The treatment and recovery can take anywhere from six to eight weeks depending upon the severity of the injury. 
returning to play or activity too soon can result in re-injury. Re-injury is actually very common for musculotendinous unit injuries. In addition to strains, there are several other types of musculotendinous unit injuries. Muscle cramps are painful involuntary skeletal muscle contractions. These occur in well-developed individuals when the muscle is in a shortened position. Muscle guarding. Following an injury, muscles within an affected area contract to splint the area in an effort to minimize pain through limitation of motion. The involuntary muscle contraction occurs as a response to pain following an injury. Muscle spasms. These are our reflex reaction that's caused by trauma. There are two types, clonic and tonic. A colonic contraction occurs as an alternating involuntary muscular contraction and relaxation in quick succession. A tonic contraction is a rigid contraction that lasts a period of time. These types of muscle spasms can lead to muscle or tendon injuries. Muscle soreness. This is an overexertion in strenuous exercise that results in muscular pain. Generally, this occurs following participation in an activity that an individual is unaccustomed to or an increase in activity. There are two types of muscle soreness, acute onset muscle soreness and delayed onset muscle soreness, also known as DOMS. Acute onset muscle soreness accompanies fatigue and is transient muscle pain experienced immediately after exercise. Delayed onset muscle soreness, also known as DOMS, is pain that occurs 24 to 48 hours following activity that gradually subsides. The individual is typically pain-free three to four days following the exercise. DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness is potentially caused by slight microtrauma to muscle or connective tissue structures. We can prevent soreness through the gradual buildup of exercise intensity. Musculotendinous unit injuries, focusing now more on tendon injuries. The tendon is a wavy parallel and cartilaginous fibers that are organized in bundles upon loading. Tendons can produce and maintain tension up to 8,700 to 18,000 pounds per square inch. Collagen straightens during the loading, but will return to shape after loading. There's a breaking point that often occurs in tendons at 6 to 8% of the increased length. Tendon tears generally occur in a muscle and not the tendon itself. Repetitive stress on a tendon can result in microtrauma and elongation, causing fibroblasts influx and increased collagen production. This repeated microtrauma may evolve into a chronic muscle strain due to reabsorption of the collagen fibers. This results in a weakening of the tendon fibers. Collagen reabsorption occurs in early periods of sport conditioning and immobilization making tissue susceptible to re-injury. Collagen reabsorption occurs in early periods of sport conditioning and following immobilization, making tissue susceptible to injury. Tissues require gradual loading and conditioning in order not to have tears. There are several different types of tendon injuries that we will discuss. Tendonitis is the gradual onset with diffuse tenderness due to repeated microtrauma and degenerative changes. This essentially is an inflammation of the tendon. The obvious signs of swelling and pain are there. Tendonitis may have what's called crepitus. Crepitus is the sticking of a tendon due to the accumulation of inflammatory byproducts on an irritated tissue. Crepitus is often described as a crunching feeling underneath the skin. The key to treating tendonitis is rest. This may require the substitution of activity to maintain fitness without stressing the injured structure. A tendinosis without proper healing. Tendonitis may begin to degenerate and result in tendinosis. 
There is less inflammation and more visible swollen tissue with stiffness and restricted range of motion. Sometimes a tender lump will appear close to the tendon. This is more common in middle or older age. Treatment involves stretching and strengthening of the tendon. Tendinopathy does not imply a particular pathology. This is often used to refer to either tendinitis or tendinosis. Tenosynovitis is an inflammation of the synovial sheath around the tendon. In acute cases, there is rapid onset crepitus, and often diffuse swelling. Chronic cases result in a thickening of the tendon with pain and crepitus. This often occurs in the long flexor tendons of the digits, including the toes and the fingers, and the biceps tendon in the upper arm. Due to the nature of the injury, anti-inflammatory agents or even surgical intervention may help with the tenosynovitis. Other types of injuries to the musculotendinous junction. Myofascial trigger points. These are discrete and hypersensitive nodules within tight bands of muscle or fascia. These are classified as latent or active. These develop as the result of a mechanical stress, either acute trauma or microtrauma, and may lead to the development of stress on the muscle fiber which then results in the formation of additional trigger points. A latent trigger point does not cause spontaneous pain. It may restrict movement or cause muscle weakness. Many individuals only become aware of their presence when pressure is applied. An active trigger point causes pain at rest. Applying pressure increases the pain and often results in what's called a jump sign. The jump sign usually indicates that your patient is trying to get away from the clinician as they have encountered a painful stimulus. Active trigger points are tender to palpation with referred pain, meaning the pain travels. Active trigger points are found most commonly in muscles involved in postural support, so we see a lot of these active trigger points in the upper and lower back. Contusions are the result of a sudden blow to the body. These can be both deep or superficial. Hematomas can result from blood and lymph that flows into surrounding tissues. This is a localization of extravasated blood into a clot encapsulated by connective tissue. The speed of the healing is dependent upon the extent of damage. Chronically inflamed and contused tissues may result in a generation of calcium deposits, also known as myositis ossificans. We can prevent this by protecting the contused area with padding. Atrophy and contractures. Atrophy is the wasting away of muscle due to immobilization, inactivity, or the loss of nerve functioning. A contracture is an abnormal shortening of muscle where there is a great deal of resistance to passive stretching. Generally, this is the result of a muscle injury, which impacts the joint, resulting in the accumulation of scar tissue. Synovial joint injuries. Synovial joints have a high line and or articular cartilage, fibrous connective tissue capsule, ligaments, capsule with synovial membrane joint cavity with synovial fluid, blood and nerve supply, muscles, and menisci, also known as fibrocartilage. Ligament sprains. These are often the result of traumatic joint twists that cause stretching or tearing of connective tissue. These are graded based upon the severity of the injury. A grade one will result in some pain, minimal loss of function, no abnormal movement, and mild point tenderness. A grade 2 sprain results in pain, moderate loss of function, swelling, and instability with tearing and separation of the ligament fibers. A grade 3 sprain is extremely painful and results in loss of function, severe instability and swelling, and may also represent a subluxation, which we'll talk about in just a second. Ligament sprains can result in joint effusion and swelling, 
local temperature increase, pain and point tenderness, and ecchymosis, which is a change in the skin coloration. The greatest difficulty with a grade one or grade two sprain is restoring stability due to the stretched tissue and inelastic scar tissue formation. To regain joint stability, strengthening of the muscles around the joint is critical. Next, we'll discuss dislocations and subluxations. These result in a separation of the bony articular surfaces. A subluxation is a partial dislocation causing incomplete separation of two bones. The bones come back together by themselves in alignment. A dislocation, on the other hand, occurs when at least one bone in a joint is forced out of alignment and must be manually or surgically reduced. There is a high level of incidence in finger and shoulder dislocations. Gross deformity is typically apparent with bilateral comparison, so looking at both sides, they do not look the same. In a dislocation, the stabilizing structures of the joint are disrupted. Unfortunately, this also results in the joint becoming susceptible to subsequent dislocations. An x-ray is the only absolute diagnostic technique to determine if a dislocation has occurred. We're able to see bone fragments from possible avulsion fractures, disruption of growth plates, and even connective tissue as a result of the dislocation. Dislocations, particularly the first time, should always be considered and treated as a fracture until a fracture has been ruled out. Osteoarthritis is the wearing away of highline cartilage. Changes in the joint mechanics lead to joint degeneration. This commonly affects weight-bearing joints, but can also impact shoulders and the cervical spine. Some symptoms of osteoarthritis include pain as the result of friction, stiffness, prominent morning pain, localized tenderness, creaking, and grating sensations. Patients will often complain of either generalized joint pain or localized pain to one side of the joint. A bursitis. A bursa is a fluid-filled sac that develops in areas of friction. Sudden irritation to the bursa can cause an acute bursitis, while overuse and constant external compression can cause chronic bursitis. Signs and symptoms include swelling, pain, and some loss of function. Repeated trauma can lead to calcification and degeneration of the internal bursa lining. Capsulitis and synovitis. Capsulitis is the result of repeated joint trauma. Synovitis can occur acutely, but will also develop following the mistreatment of a joint injury. Chronic synovitis can result in edema, thickening of the synovial lining, exudation, and a fibrous underlying can develop. The individual's motion can become restricted and joint noises may develop. Bone characteristics. There are some anatomical characteristics that we'll discuss. This includes a dense connective tissue matrix, outer compact tissue, an inner porous cancellous bone, including Heversian canals. This is a diagram of the longitudinal section of bone, and it describes its anatomical characteristics. Bony functions. Bones function to support the body. They provide protection to organs. They allow for movement through joints and levers. They provide calcium storage and the formation of blood cells. This is a process called hematopoiesis. There are different types of bone and classification. Bones are classified according to their shape. Flat bones, such as the skull, ribs, and scapula occur. Irregular bones include our vertebrae and our skull. Short bones include the wrist and the ankle. And long bones include the humerus, ulna, tibia, radius, fibula, and femur. These are the bones that are most commonly injured during sports and activity participation. The gross structure. There is the diaphysis, which is the shaft, which is hollow and cylindrical. It is covered by compact bone. The medullary cavity contains yellow marrow and is lined by the endiosteum. 
The bone's epiphysis is composed of cancellous bone and has high-line cartilage covering. It provides areas for muscles attachments. The periosteum of the bone is a dense white fibrous covering that penetrates the bone via Sharpie's fibers. This section of the bone contains blood vessels and osteoblasts. Bone growth. Ossification occurs from the synthesis of bone organic matrix, the work of the osteoblasts and osteoclasts. This involves the growth of the diaphysis and the epiphyseal growth plates towards one another. As cartilage matures, immature osteoblasts replace to ultimately form solid bone. Deforming forces can result in premature injury, and growth plate dislocation can alter growth patterns or may result in deformity of the bone. The bone's diameter increases via the activity of the osteoblasts, adding to the exterior while the osteoclasts break down bone in the medullary cavity. At full size, bones maintain a state of balance between osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity. A change in activity or hormonal levels can alter balance. Bone loss begins to exceed external bone growth over time. As thickness decreases, bones are less resistant to forces, also known as osteoporosis. Bones' functional adaptation to stresses follows Wolf's Law. Every change in form or function or in its function alone is followed by a change in architectural design. For some individuals, the simplest interpretation of Wolf's Law is bone will either adapt to the forces that are placed upon it or it will ultimately fail. Bone fractures. This is what happens when Wolf's Law fails. Bone fractures are classified as either closed or open. Closed fractures are those where there is little movement or displacement. Open fractures involve a displacement of the fractured ends and breaking through the surrounding tissue. The diagram on the left describes common classifications of bone fractures. These include a green stick or incomplete break, commuted with four fragments at the fracture site, linear where the bone splits along its length, transverse or non-displaced, a straight line perpendicular to the bone shaft, oblique non-displaced, a diagonal cracking along the bone shaft, and finally, a spiral, having S-shaped separation. Bone strength and shape. The strength of the bone can be impacted by changes in shape and direction. Long bones can sometimes have a gradual change that are less prone to injury. The cylindrical and hollow nature of bones makes them very strong and resistant to bending and twisting. Bone loading characteristics. Bones can be stressed or loaded to failure by tension, compression, bending, twisting, and even shearing. Long bone load characteristics. These either occur in singularity or in combination. There's an amount of load that also impacts the nature of the fracture. While forces go into fracturing the bone, some energy and force is also absorbed by the adjacent soft tissues. Bone has elastic properties, allowing it to bend to a certain level. Stress fractures. These injuries occur with no specific cause, but with a number of possible injury causes. The most common is overload due to muscular contraction, altered stress distribution due to muscle fatigue, changes in training surface, and rhythmic repetitive stress vibrations. Bone becomes susceptible early in training due to an increase in the muscular forces and initial remodeling and reabsorption of bone. Progression involves focal microfracture, periosteal or endosteal response to stress fractures, linear fractures, and possibly even displaced fractures. Early detection of a stress fracture is difficult. A bone scan may be useful, or x-rays can be effective after several weeks. Stress fractures can be caused by coming back to competition too soon following injury, changing events without proper conditioning, starting initial training too quickly, changing training habits such as the surface, shoes, or other factors, and a variety of postural and foot conditions. 
The signs and symptoms of stress fractures include focal tenderness and pain in the early stages, with pain becoming consistent and more intense, particularly at night. The most common sites to have a stress fracture include the tibia, fibula, metatarsal shaft, calcaneus, femur, pars intraarticularis in the spine, ribs, and even the humerus. The management for stress fractures varies with the individual, the injury site, and the extent of the injury. Epiphyseal conditions. There are three types that can be sustained by adolescents, which often involves an injury to the growth plate, articular epiphysis, and apophyseal injuries. These types of injuries occur most often in children aged 10 to 16 years. These are classified by Salter Harris into five types. As far as apophyseal injuries, young, physically active individuals are more susceptible. An apophysis serves as a site of origin or insertion for muscles. A common avulsion condition includes either Sievers disease or Oshkoslaughter's disease. Typically, these are traction type of injuries where the tissue is pulling away from the bone. The body lays down calcium to try to keep the tissue there, resulting in the formation of a bony nodule. This diagram indicates the Salter-Harris classification of fractures. Nerve trauma. Abnormal nerve responses can be attributed to injury or athletic participation. The most frequent injury is neuropraxia produced by direct trauma. Lacerations of the nerves can occur as well as compression of the nerves as a result of fractures and dislocations that can impact nerve function. Nerve trauma, the anatomical characteristics of nerve. Nerves provide sensitivity and communication from the central nervous system to muscles, sensory organs, and and other various systems in the periphery. Neuron cell bodies have large nucleuses with branched dendrites that respond to neurotransmitter substances. The anatomical characteristics of nerve. Each nerve cell has an axon that conducts a nerve impulse. Axons are encased in a neurolimal sheath known as swan and satellite cells. Various neurological cells in the central nervous system help to form a framework for nervous tissue. Nerve injuries typically occur as either compression or tension. These may be acute or chronic injuries. Neuropraxia is the interruption in conduction through nerve fibers. This is brought about via compression or blunt trauma. The most common impact includes the motor more than sensory function. There is a temporary loss of function for the individual. Most often, pain can be referred from neurological injuries as well. Nerve trauma descriptors. Physical trauma causes pain and can result in a host of sensory responses, including pinching, burning, tingling, muscle weakness, numbness, radiating pain, and even referred pain. Long-term problems can go from minor nerve problems to complete paralysis. Body mechanics and injury susceptibility. The body moves very effectively in an upright position, and we are able to overcome great forces even with inefficient lever systems. The body must overcome inertia, muscle viscosity, and unfavorable angles of pull sometimes depending on the position we place it in. The mechanical reasons for injuries. These can include hereditary components, congenital components, or acquired defects may predispose an athlete or individual to injury. The body's build, structural makeup, and habitual incorrect application of skill may also predispose an individual to injury. Microtrauma and overuse syndrome. These are injuries as a result of abnormal and repetitive stresses and microtraumas that fall into a class with certain identifiable syndromes. They frequently result in a limitation or curtailment of sport involvement, 
This is often seen in skills such as running, jumping, and throwing activities. Microtrauma and overuse syndrome. Some of these injuries, while small, can be debilitating. Common repetitive overuse and stress injuries include Achilles tendonitis, shin splints, stress fractures, Oshkut Slaughter's disease, runner's and jumper's knee, patellar conromalacia, which is a softening of the underside of the patella, and apophyseal avulsions. Postural deviations. These are often the underlying cause of injury. These deviations may be the result of unilateral muscle, bony, or soft tissue asymmetries. Sport or exercise activities may cause asymmetries to develop and may result in poor pathomechanics. Imbalances are manifested by postural deviations as the body tries to regain its balance in relation to the center of gravity and may ultimately become the primary cause of injury. Postural conditions can make an individual exceedingly more prone to injuries.